so I'm not sharing. So we're ready for the first uh, speaker. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jessica Webb. Uh, Dr. Webb is a consultant cardiologist here at St. Thomas's Hospital. Uh, she specializes in multimodality imaging and inherited cardiac conditions, and she's the clinical lead uh, for heart failure. Dr. Webb is uh, also a member of our pregnancy heart team. Uh, to put some of the later talks on cardiac pathology uh, during pregnancy into context, Dr. Webb will start by talking us through the usual cardiovascular adaptations in pregnancy. Thank you very much, Jess. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? I'm trying to share and it's not sharing. Um, I've sent the slides. I'll tr I've tried twice. Bear with me. Yes, I, I can load them if you prefer. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, just as we're loading them, it's my great pleasure to talk this afternoon on the cardiovascular adaptations in pregnancy. Um, I'm an ICC consultant and the lead for heart failure, and I've seen the slides for this afternoon, and I think it's fantastic learning and a great opportunity. Um, we have certainly been a very busy unit recently, and the cases that we're presenting are very interesting. Perfect, here is my slides, thank you. Um, my first slide is my introduction, and my second slide really Can I have my second slide, please, Andrea? Thank you. Sorry um, about that. No apologies. It was really setting the scene, and, and Antonio's just done a fantastic job in doing so. Um, the Embrace audit is, you know, looks at cases that go wrong, and the two years before COVID, you know, 191 women died during only six weeks after pregnancy. That's 8.8 .8 women per 100,000. 2 million women had uneventful pregnancies. This report also looks at the 495 women who died up to a year following pregnancy. And what you can see on the right is a little bit small, is the schematic clearly stating that everyone has to contribute and come together and work part as part of the MDT. In the blue outer circle, you can see key issues, reducing gap in knowledge, improving training, education, tackling inequality, preventing obesity and other risk factors. And in the purple, working as an MDT, recognising the abnormal, understanding of physiology, assessing and reassessing risk in these women and personalising their care, with the centre of that schematic being the woman with the baby. And I think the themes that we'll run through this afternoon are really working together and ensuring that we give these patients the best care that they deserve. And next slide. And repeating very much what Antonio's just said, heart disease is a leading cause of death, followed by epilepsy and stroke, with sepsis and thrombosis and thrombobism next. Uh, maternal death from preeclampsia and eclampsia continue to be low, but hasn't changed significantly in the last 10 years. Cancer being the most frequent cause of death for women between six weeks and a year, and maternal suicide being the most common cause of death after that. And what you can see on the bottom left is as inequalities. Asian women and mixed ethnicity women are twice as likely to die during pregnancy in the six weeks afterwards, with an increased risk in black women. And you also see on the right that women who come from the most deprived areas have increased risk of death which demonstrates that we can reduce health inequalities and improve people's risks and give proper counselling, we can improve these outcomes. And what's not mentioned on these slides, of course, is maternal age. So as women have their children later, the risk of pregnancy is increased. So next slide, please. During pregnancy, the pregnant mother goes to, through significant anatomical and physiological changes in order to provide for the fetus. And what you can see in this slide in time is the pregnancy on the x-axis x axis and change on the y. And you can see in black an increase in cardiac output, increase in stroke volume, heart rate and plasma volume, and a reduction in the mean arterial pressure and also the peripheral vascular resistance. And this is data that's been derived from hemodynamic studies looking at women from Preconception, six weeks, 13 weeks, 23 weeks, for a final trimester, and also after delivery. And this was cardiac output assessed by non invasive um, measures. And next slide. And breaking that down a little bit more, what we can see is that the changes in cardiovascular system in pregnancy are very profound and begin quite early. At eight weeks, 
when some women will only know they've been pregnant for a week or two, the cardiac output has been increased by 20%, achieving a maximum at approximately 20 to 28 weeks and with very little difference thereafter. This is really achieved by peripheral violet vasodilation, uh, which is nitric oxide synthesis and vasodilatory prostaglandins. You see an increase in stroke volume. And from that, you see the increase in LV wall in the heart. You can see an increase in end diastolic volume, but not end diastolic pressure seen in pregnancy. And the heart is dilated and myocardial contractility will be increased. Although the stroke volume declines during towards term, the increase in maternal heart rate preserves the cardiac output throughout. The blood pressure is reduced in the first two trimesters and then will increase in the final trimester. So there's a massive difference from very early on in the pregnancy to delivery and afterwards as well. Next slide. This is a picture on the left of a gravid uterus, a baby compressing on the IVC, and this is aortocaval compression. The position of the baby on the preload will make a big difference. We know that this really makes a big difference in 20 weeks and reduces the venous return by up to 20%. Turning from the lateral to the supine position will reduce the out cardiac output by about 25%. And so switching back increases the ejection fraction, cardiac output and diastolic volumes. And we've seen recent studies from CMR looking at the size of left atrial diameters on changing a position in pregnant women. The reduced output is associated with a reduction in uterine blood flow and therefore in placental perfusion, which could potentially compromise the fetus. And women who are pregnant who will have to be nursed laying down will have be modified either with a pillow or try to switch position to ensure that this doesn't impact the preload. Thank you. This is a slide showing maternal intravascular volume changes and the blood volume increases from six to eight weeks, reaching a maximum at approximately 32 to 34 weeks with very little change thereafter. The plasma volume increases by 45%, which again is mediated by um, hormones initiating the renal angiotensin system and aldosterone pathways. The total body water increases secondary to renal sodium retention. The red cell mass increases by 20 to 30%, and you have a hemodilution, which we say is the physiological anemia of pregnancy, going from about 15 grams per litre to 12 grams per litre. And most women will take supplemental iron and folic acid if that becomes um, significant. The blood volume normally returns to approximately normal between 10 to 14 days postpartum. And we see with the contracting uterus, which I'll show you in a moment, that there's an autotransfusion of approximately 300 to 500 mils for vaginal births and up to a litre for cesareans, which is important for women who have cardiac disease and struggle with maintaining that extra volume. So what do we see clinically? Women who are pregnant will be examined and will have a bounding or collapsing pulse a murmur, which can be audible, audible throughout the precordium, a loud heart sound, and possibly even a third heart sound. They'll have ectopic, and peripheral, ectopic beats and peripheral edemia. On the 12 DCG, we'll see a tachycardia and ectopics, possibly a Q-wave, ST depression and T-wave inversion and left axis deviation. And that's typically because the heart's been moved over to the left side. And on the transthoracic echo, in a normal pregnancy, we'll see an increase in mass the LVN dimensions will increase and there'll be enlargement of both atria and the right ventricle with increased velocities through the left and right outflow tracks. And regurgitant lesions will be increased because of the increased blood volume. So what happens in labour? So labour is associated with further increases in cardiac output. 15% in the first stage and 50% in the second stage. And what you can see on the left is time, pre-labor, labor and after delivery. And the difference between labor and actually active contractions. And as the second stage of labor continues, the cardiac output increases. And as 
the women have contractions, their cardiac output increases even further. The response to, oh, apologies, not quite finished. The response to pain is even more important for these women because if women are, pain, are in pain or are anxious, their heart rate will increase as well their blood pressure. So effective analgesia is more important than anything else. What you can see, just to, specify, just to be very clear, that the cardiac output increases throughout the labour, even when the patient's not having contractions. Thank you. And so managing the third stage of labour, because the obstetricians, will, it's not just about getting the baby out, and actually oxytocin, which is abundant and sometimes given to women who have a haemorrhage, can also impact uh, the cardiovascular system, which if a patient has an existing cardiac disease or condition can be quite critical. So oxytocin will result in uterine uh, contractions and have a significant impact on hemodynamics, causing possibly hypertension, tachycardia, and actually has been associated with poor outcomes and death. And postpartum, the body continues to recover. And what we see in twin pregnancies is that all the hemodynamics are more profound, approximately 15 to 20% increases in volume and more significant increases in cardiac outputs. And this will typically improve, but can take up to six months. And the blood volume decreases by 10% within the first three days, really throughout using diuresis, natural diuresis. And this is a study which was published in 2014 of women who had known structural heart disease. And when they presented with heart failure symptoms, and what you can see is two peaks. In the second trimester, between 24 and 30 weeks and postpartum. And they looked at the women who presented with heart failure and tried to identify why they presented and these patients had LV impairment before delivery. Uh, they had high risk of having pulmonary hypertension, were more symptomatic at rest. But actually, the slide also demonstrates that these women can present at any time throughout their pregnancy and afterwards. And it's important to continue to reassess these women. So when we look at the breakdown of the cardiac women we see at Guys and St. Thomas's, most probably about half the patients have congenital heart disease, with about 25 to 30% having heart failure and inherited cardiac conditions. And then valvular disease, aortopathies, arrhythmias, ischemic heart disease and pulmonary hypertension are common, but less so. And of course, trying to understand some of our patients will present to us not having known that they've had any heart disease before. And this is my last slide. And I borrowed it from a heart rhythm uh, journal, and I thought it was an excellent public uh, schematic, not least because it kind of talked about patients with inherited arrhythmias, mm -hmm. pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, labour and postpartum, but really demonstrated the importance of the multidisciplinary team and working together to try to reduce the risk and give the woman as much information she can need throughout this time. Thank you.